We've been discussing the fight to preserve and expand reproductive rights across the country since the launch of not only this show, but ACT TV itself. Earlier today, the Supreme Court decided to hear arguments against the Texas SB8 abortion law on this coming Monday, November 1st. Texas's SB8 law is one of the most restrictive anti-choice abortion regulations in the country, and the ripple effects are being felt not just in Texas, but across the United States. These effects are tangible, not some far off policy that's hard to connect to our daily lives and the lives of our loved ones. Here to discuss the effects she has seen firsthand uh, on both the medical community and on patients, Dr. Mira Shah. Dr. Shah is the Chief Medical Officer for Planned Parenthood in Hudson Peconic, the abortion an abortion care provider in New York and a fellow with Physicians for Reproductive Health. She's the author of You're the Only One I've Told, Stories Behind Abortion. Dr. Shaw, thanks for joining us on the program today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, you know, we were going to just specifically talk about the effects that these laws are having, and, and who better to talk about that uh, than yourself. And then all of a sudden, right before record time today, um, these cases that are going to be heard in front of the Supreme Court came up. The whole woman's health versus Jackson asked the question of the court whether a state can insulate from federal court review a law that prohibits the exercise of a constitutional right by delegating it to the general public to uh, the authority to enforce that prohibition with civil actions. And then the United States v. Texas, which they're also hearing on Monday, concerns the government's right, the federal government's right, to tell, challenge that Texas law in federal court. The question that's really being presented to the Supreme Court is, may the United States bring suit in federal court and obtain um, you know, an, an injunct injunctive, or I think it's called injunctive or declaratory relief against the state, state court judges, state court clerks, other state officials, or all private parties oh. to prohibit that law, SB8, from being enforced. So these laws that they're listening to are not like, let's overturn Roe, or is this law constitutional? It's really on matters of, of um, are states allowed to do whatever they want? And did I get that right? Yes, um, that's and, and and I will I will say that I by training am a physician um, and know how to provide medical care. Um, and unfortunately, I've had to become um, pretty in tune with public policy as well because um, bad policy, as you know, directly impacts the work that myself and my colleagues do. Um, and so that I can speak to very well. Um, yes, and, and so, I'm glad you could come here uh, to talk to us about that. Um, yeah. so, so, uh, can you talk about how onerous the Texas reproductive health landscape already was before the law? I understand you, you worked in Texas and you also regularly went to, or maybe still go to Indiana, home of the despicable Mike Pence to provide I do. abortion I do. care. I do. I, I regularly go to Indiana to Whole Women's Health Alliance. Um, that has a health, they have a health center in South Bend. I'm also on the board of Whole Women's Health Alliance. Um, and so I work very closely with the organization that is challenging what's going on in Texas right now. Um, prior to SB8, um, the organization um, was, you know, facing a lot of restrictions with regards to how they were delivering um, abortion care. Um, and they still are, um, and, and those, those restrictive laws are still in place um, and still preventing people from accessing um, this vital care. So waiting periods and you know, having a mandatory ultrasound and having a mandatory um, script read to patients with, quite honestly, lies um, of information um, regarding. You've had their to read health. those yourself. I have. Um, you know, I we've had to um, say to patients in Texas that abortion um, causes breast cancer, and I will tell you that that is not true. Um, but unfortunately, the the state does require that we say that in Indiana, we have to say. When you read it, are you like the state requires me to read this? I'm just saying it's the state recommend. That's the requirement. Like, do you? I I don't yeah. want to get you in trouble here, but um, do providers tend to do that? Yeah, I mean, we do. We provide that. You know, that we piggyback um, sort of the script with you know, what we know is true. And we share with them the the science. Um, 
it's not fair to patients to leave them thinking that what I'm reading is true. I mean, you know, the I took an oath to first do no harm. And I do think that telling patients, and I, I know that telling patients inaccurate information can be harmful to them. Um, it can uh, cause yeah. unnecessary anxiety and unnecessary stress, right? Mm -hmm. um, in Indiana, we have to say that, that, that physicians, or excuse me, that abortions um, can cause um, depression, PTSD, um, you know, that, and, and other states have other lies um, that they require their providers to, to tell the patients. Do they so, know what having an unwanted child can do? Do you get to read that in the law? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I mean, really. <gasps> and and, and, and the good. the horrible thing about all of this is that um, that the policymakers themselves are just very out of touch with reality and have no understanding of, or just simply don't care what impact their laws have on patients' lives. And currently, you know, what I'm hearing, I, I, I don't work in Texas anymore, but what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that SB8 has been devastating to patients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what it's causing is patients to not be able to access abortion care because the health centers in Texas are limiting who they are, you know, providing care to because, you know, people are scared of being sued. And, what, are people, uh, what are people doing? What are on the ground in Texas? What are people um, who are seeking abortion care? What are they doing? Are they going out of state? Are they? So I know that there's a lot of media attention around people traveling. And yes, that is happening. But I do want to point out that that in itself is is almost a luxury, right? To be able to travel means that you are able to afford that time off. You are able to afford um, the transportation costs, whether it be a flight, a train, you know, gas, um, you're able to find childcare for the children you already have. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the surrounding states, so the states around Texas also are conservative and have restrictive laws in place, many of them requiring multiple visits to the health center. So then the individual, so the patient is going to have to stay in a hotel with a friend, which is then yet another added cost. So a lot of people, you know, are making really difficult decisions. Um, mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is an uptick in people um, accessing abortion care um, from the internet. They're buying pills. Um, mm -hmm. And through, you know, other, other organizations that are trying really hard to provide them with safe access to abortion care. But and pills aren't really, aren't, I mean, past a certain point, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about this, but uh, in terms of the medical, uh, isn't there at a certain point that the pill part isn't workable? Yeah, so the um, medication abortion is, is it can be used up to 11 weeks gestational age. Mm -hmm. um, in some states it's 10, some, you know, protocols can vary, but the data that we have supports the use of medication abortion, so mifepristone and misoprostol um, to terminate a pregnancy, to up to 11 weeks in gestational age. So what you're alluding to is that some people, you know, are going to be pushed later in gestational age because of all of these laws, which we know was already happening. And then, you know, is there, the, is there a the danger range, to the mother's health or the woman's health or the pregnant well, person's health? Yes. I mean, if there is, if they aren't able to access abortion care, um, then, you know, that's going to increase their risk of, you know, depending on, so if, if <laughs> of everything, well, I mean, I if, mean. If, if it is something that an individual feels like they need, or if there's a medical indication for an abortion, then, you know, there's panic. I know, um, I know that my, one of my colleagues has shared with me that, that he had a patient who, who was undergoing um, um, cancer treatment and has six children and found herself to be pregnant and, you know, needed to terminate the pregnancy, but she's already past this, you know, the mark or the point at which she could legally have an abortion um, in, in Texas. And let me, I, I wanna be very careful with, with the language that I use because the individual having the abortion in Texas would not be prosecuted. It would be, it's the people who were aiding and abetting the people who are assisting that individual in having the abortion who could be sued. Um, but if people are scared of being sued, then, and, you know, and they're fearful, um, then 
then they're not going to be providing the abortion care or, you know, working at the clinics or even taking Ubers or, mm -hmm. or driving the Ubers to transport the patients to the health center. Um, and therefore, the patients are then not able to access care. What effect has this had on providers in Texas? And then I want to ask you about the ripple effects you've seen going on. You talked a little bit about this already in neighboring states for providers um, or even as far as away, you know, both politically and, and, and physically in, in states as New York. Have you seen ripple effects on providers? Yeah, I mean the my colleagues and close friends in Texas, I mean, aren't able to provide care, they're turning patients away, um, which is really hard, especially when you do this type of work. I mean, you're doing most of, you know, the the, the providers that I know who are who are providing abortion care are so compassionate and so dedicated to this work, because they really understand how important it is. Mm -hmm. And having to turn a patient away is really hard. Many people have gotten um, medical, I, I know one colleague in particular who's gotten a medical license in Oklahoma so that she can travel there to to kind of alleviate some of the burden that the providers in Oklahoma are now seeing, right? Because they are, they are booked up um, mm -hmm. and they only have so many providers because as you, as you might know, there's a nationwide shortage of abortion providers, mm. um, which is for example, why I, ha why I fly to Indiana to provide care. Um, well, and then we're seeing in New York, we've seen a couple patients come to us from Texas to receive procedural abortion um, and then fly back. But again, that's that's not the case for everyone. Not, it's very expensive. Not everyone is able to do that. Plus, you kind of have to risk your life now going on a plane. I mean, there's still COVID. <laughs> there's, there is. There yeah. is. Yeah. Um, I know there's been lots of violence and threats of violence against abortion providers. Have we seen any impact from these restrictive laws going into effect on that? Well, I think that there's been a lot of ce um, celebration from the anti-abortion movement and a lot of threats and from neighboring states to copy what um, has happened um, in Texas. And what I can say is that, you know, that the federal government, um, the Department of Justice, you know, are they, they recognize how important it is to preserve access to abortion care, and they are trying to intervene quickly. Mm. Unfortunately, not quickly enough, because we've seen this go on since September first, and the impacts are devastating. Because abortion is a time-sensitive um, issue that needs to be addressed, mm. and should be addressed on the day that the person wants that care. Um, but that's just not the case. And so, you know, there's, there's been, you know, like I said, st neighboring states wanting to do similar, similar work, um, pass similar laws. Um, and so we really do need federal input um, on this issue so that we can protect abortion access. Do you have um, any specific, I think I find that the, the audience who might be on the fence or not really active in this fight uh, they need something tangible, like really seriously tangible, much like what you did in your book. Um, the book is You're the Only One I've Told. These are some stories behind abortion. Do you have any stories you might be able to tell us from personal experience from, of, of um, I mean, I know obviously you're not going to out someone, <laughs> but uh, of people you've cared for, people your colleagues have cared for, or your colleagues or yourself, um, that really the audience can get a sense of exactly down to the granular level um, how these things are affecting individuals? Yeah, I mean, it's so, you know, when you talk about the people who are on the fence or maybe, you know, like to engage in sort of anti-abortion rhetoric, when I hear that, I think, you know, I think that those individuals don't really understand what abortion means and what abortion access mm. um, it, how it can be so life affirming. Um, and so one way to um, educate themselves is by reading my book um, or just talking about abortion openly, because I guarantee they know they know somebody, they love somebody who has had an abortion. More often than not, people have had one, right? One in four women have had an abortion in their lifetime. Um, so it's, but, but it's more common to not talk about it than it is to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and just recognizing that there is no typical abortion patient they come, people who have abortions come from every socioeconomic background, every um, racial, ethnic identity, religious background. Mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, Christians have abortions, Catholics have abortions, Hindus, Muslims, Jains, you know, uh, Jews, 
every every type of in person has an abortion. And I think that people fail to recognize that. Mm. Um, and that it, it, an individual's decision to not continue a pregnancy should be their own um, and, sh- and, and should be accessible without political interference. Um, and, and I think it's really important that people try to educate themselves from reliable sources um, and, and try to learn more because there's a lot of great information out there that myself and my colleagues are, are advocating for and putting out there. So. I have a friend who is an abortion provider and she once told me a story about a woman who literally was picketing um, the, I believe it was the Planned Parenthood and then came inside for her own treatment <laughs> and then went back outside to the picket line so I've, I've definitely um, cared for patients who I've cared for one um, patient uh, who is a frequent protester or was a frequent protester. She would come to our health center and protest. I did care for her, provide her abortion care, and I actually have not seen her out there again. Um, I just yesterday cared for a patient who is a no, that's a whole. I'm sorry to pause you. That's a hopeful thought. <laughs> That, yeah. Oh, well, maybe. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go and ahead. that's actually really common in the human experience that once we recognize that something is like, you know, that it's either Im- impacting us directly or to a loved one, all of a sudden it becomes personal and it becomes important and it becomes valuable enough to protect. And that's why I encourage folks to talk about it. Um, because again, I guarantee you know somebody or you love somebody who has had an abortion. Um yeah. And I, you know, just yesterday I had a patient who I cared for who was applying to medical school and she found herself pregnant and she was using birth control. She was devastated, she, you know. So even individuals who are using contraception, contraception can fail. And um, people need to be able to access abortion care so that, like this person I saw yesterday, is still able to take her exams and apply to medical school. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. It's it's to me it's sad that that we have to know someone like the Cheneys when Dick Cheney <laughs> was like oh my daughter's gay so I guess being gay is okay now or a lesbian whatever um it, you, you for me it's like no if this hurts people Absolutely. if I don't know them particularly th- this this should be you know, adjudicated oh, absolutely. Hurts people. I think unfortunately the reality is that people feel empathy in different ways, right? I am the same way. Um, yeah. that, you know, I, I, yes, I, I completely agree with you in that regard. Um, but I do think that the more we talk about this and the more we exchange in dialogue and the more people share their stories, I think I'm a scientist. I can share the data. I'm, um, you know, a physician who cares for patients, so I can share both the data and the stories, and in hopes to create some sort of change among, um, create change along the cultural sort of narrative around abortion. Because uh, yeah, it needs some work. It needs some work, and we're here. We're here to help with that here yeah. on Mag TV. Um, any final um, thoughts or stories about? I know it. It must be saddening, as you said. Um, even devastating, I think, is the word that you use to providers in that area who are unable to to help patients. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the provider experience so people can get a sense of, of what that looks like? Yeah. Um, and as I said, um, people who provide abortion care are incredible human beings. They're some of the most incredible people I know. And I am so lucky to be part of a community of physicians and nurse practitioners and midwives and PAs who love this work and who, you know, realize that providing such a simple service can really change the course of an individual's life and really help them celebrate the bodily autonomy that everyone deserves and needs. Um, And I, you know, I, I just want to be able to thank you for giving me the opportunity to paint the picture of like who we are because we are kind, we are compassionate and we really care about our patients and we want the best for them. Um, and if that means providing them with an abortion, um, then, you know, we want to be able to do that. We want to be able to care for our patients because turning them away is, is really hard. It's really hard. Thank you so much for joining me on the 
program. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, and I really appreciate the work that you do. It's actually r- rather heroic in these times uh, to mm-hmm. do the work that you do. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, We're speaking with Dr. Mira Shaw, who provides abortion care in New York and is a fellow with the Physicians for Reproductive Health. Don't forget to to check out Dr. Shaw's book. It's been out for a while. We're not book Mm. promoting, but I would, Mm. it's, it's, it's very, very deeply moving. The book is You're the Only One I've Told Stories Behind Abortion. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. You've been watching ACT Now. I'm Juliana Forlano. Was that not amazing? Definitely take that first part of the episode clip it or you can check out our youtube page because the clip of it will be there and send it to your local school district and say hey um are we doing active shooter drills uh could we not do it with the blood if we have to do it at all i'm gonna do that myself i'm juliana forlano you can follow me on twitter at juliana forlano or follow act tv across platforms to see the other stuff that this great platform is doing Thanks for watching. We'll see you Thursday when we have Josh Holland on to do the headlines with us and a little interview with Professor Richard Wolf, along with an appearance by our good friend Jocelyn from ACT TV. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.